Um, welcome to Town Hall, folks. Uh, this is our regular town board meeting. We have a full and exciting agenda for tonight. I will preview for you in a minute. But um, first, of all, I'm going to ask our deputy town clerk to take attendance. Um, we'll ask Esther Baitler to lead us on the pledge, and then we'll get going. Good evening, and welcome to the town of Orangetown. This is a regular town board meeting of Tuesday, August 15th, and on a roll call, Councilman Troy. Present. Councilman Diveny. Here. Councilman Valentine. Here. Councilman Batari. Here. Supervisor Stewart. Here. Can Thank you. Esther, Esther Baitler to please lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Esther, and, and thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. Um, just to give you just a little bit of a roadmap, um, there are a bunch of announcements listed on the first page of this agenda. I'm not going to go through them individually, um, but I do want to call your attention to them because they're all important and they are a series of meetings related to our budget process and some very important events in the town. Um, our process tonight is we're going to have a public comment period. There's a sign-up sheet out front for that. Um, then we'll have a raise of hands, comments under three minutes, and, and, uh, and we, we thank you for coming out and speaking to the town board. We don't always have the opportunity to go back and forth, uh, but we want to hear what you have to say. Um, then we have a, a, uh, a um, before we do that, we're going to have a brief presentation actually by our town auditors, um, which we do. Um, let's see, what did I actually, what order was I going to do? Yeah, we're going to do that before the public comment so that they can um, update us on the audit and, and move on their way. Um, then we'll have public comment. Then we have a public hearing, which is a different kind of public comment period where it's specific to a change in the town code related to historic preservation. And I know there are a couple of people to speak on that, um, and the details of it are in the agenda as far as the proposed revisions go. Um, uh, then I hope to have a vote on that historic um, preservation code amendment um, and then we're going to take I'm going to propose a quick executive session for the town board to consult with our attorney um, regarding the next two items on the agenda which have to do with a, of a contract for sale of town land for a data center project and a related tax agreement and I want the town board um, just to meet briefly with our legal counsel um, to make sure that they're uh, clear on the latest um, revisions to those very important agreements um, then we'll be back and we'll finish up the agenda and, uh, and that's kind of where things stand. So that's your, your preview. Um, so going back to the beginning again, um, I just wanted to um, invite uh, to start with our, our representatives from our annual audit uh, consultant um, and, uh, and also recognize before you start Jeff Bensick, who's our finance director and, um, and his staff who work so hard in partnership with our auditors to do an annual review and accounting of all the town funds. And the, the um, document that's produced is available for public review. Um, the, we just handed out fresh copies to the town board members, just a reminder, because you already have copies from the last presentation, if you could just return those to the finance director when the meeting's over, because you um, need them for other purposes. Um, and it's a significant undertaking, uh, and we welcome uh, members of O'Connor Davies here. Uh, please take it away, guys. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, and I should say, by the way, that we, we, we did have a presentation in a workshop session of, of, in detail of, of the audit and its results. We wanted to make sure that the public, in a public setting, also had a chance. And of course, we're on television, as people probably realize. Just have a chance to, to hear them speak a bit um, and answer any questions the town board might have. Thank you. My name is Scott Oling. Uh, to my right, I'm accompanied by uh, Rob Danielle, who is the actual engagement partner uh, for the uh, audit that we conducted for the town for the year end of December 31st, 2016. 
as the supervisor mentioned, uh, we were here last month at a work session meeting uh, and went over this uh, report in detail. So tonight we'll, we'll, we'll try to do it at a, at a little higher level, but still give you, you know, a lot of the information uh, that was provided uh, at that meeting uh, last month. So you do have in front of you a copy, a rather a large document, uh, the annual audit report, which is over 170 pages long. Um, what the town does and should be very proud of is that this report is what's known as a CAFR, a Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. It's not required. The town, uh, you know, essentially goes the extra mile in preparing additional information that goes in this report that's not in a lot of other municipal reports. And uh, they do that because uh, it gets submitted uh, to Chicago to the National Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA. And the report essentially gets graded uh, by GFOA to see that it, that it meets uh, certain you know, standards that have to be done you know, on a national uh, basis. And the town has uh, been awarded uh, the Certificate of Achievement uh, for its presentation of its 2015 uh, audit report. And this report was you know, recently submitted over the last two, three months to, to, to be graded for its uh, 2016 presentation. So you should be proud of that. It has additional information uh, in the front of the report. And more importantly, it has a lot of additional information in the back of the report, beginning on pages, uh, page 137 for the next 30 or so pages. It has a lot of tenure information on the town, both financial information and some non-financial information. So it allows you to see certain trends in financial numbers and various other you know, non-financial uh, related uh, matters. So what we just want to take our couple of minutes on tonight is to talk about you know, the financial results of the town for 2016. And beginning on page uh, two, which is after a set of the uh, Roman numerals at the beginning of the report, is our audit opinion, which is really the only part of this report that belongs to us as the auditor. And what we're basically saying is that we believe that these financial statements fairly present your results of operations uh, for your 2016 uh, fiscal year. The town obviously operates a variety of funds. Rob is going to take you through some of the bigger funds and, and give you some of the highlights of, of what happened financially in those funds. Uh, and that's what's in this report. Also, you should note for this year, um, because uh, the town received over $750,000 in federal aid, that's the threshold that requires you to have what's known as a compliance audit under uh, federal requirements. Uh, the town received over a million dollars this year in federal aid, mostly in, in transportation uh, area uh, for those kinds of projects. So that required a compliance audit to make sure that those federal dollars were spent uh, the way the federal government wants those dollars spent. So the information for the federal part of this audit, uh, you know, begins on page around 167 and 169, and the detail of the federal dollars is on page 170. Uh, but we had no findings, uh, you know, as to your uh, federal compliance audit, and that information was uh, supplied to the federal uh, government. So with that, I'm going to have Rob take you through uh, some of the big numbers uh, in the report, starting with the general fund, and the general fund that he will take you through um, uh, begins uh, on page 73. Thank you, Scott, and good evening. All right, page 73 and 74 um, is a presentation of the general fund comparative schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Page 73 would be the 2016 results with the comparative uh, 2015 results on page 74. Again, you'll see four columns there. Original budget is what the town board adopted back in the winter of 2015. You have a final budget during the year. There are certain modifications made to the budget. The third column is your actual results, and the fourth column is a variance between your final budget and your actual results. So in the aggregate, in the general fund, the total revenues came in at $12.6 million compared to your uh, final budget of just under $12 million. Again, a favorable variance of around $687,000, and that was made up in a variety of categories. Um, a couple of things to throw out. Um, your franchise fees and your sales tax came in about $275,000 better than you anticipated or better than you budgeted. Uh, in the area of federal aid, the uh, town did receive a, a substance abuse grant, which wasn't uh, anticipated when the budget was developed, so that generated additional revenue of $123,000. And in the category miscellaneous, uh, the town did receive a payment from uh, the golf course funds. Um, 
as you are aware, in 2015, the, the town um, reclassed certain advances that it had made to the Gulf Fund in the form of a loan. The town took an allowance against that loan, never wrote the loan off, actually passed a resolution to say we're gonna pay back this money over, over some time, and it began to do so in 2016 with a minimum of $200,000, as the resolution stated. On the expense side, as you can see, your total expenditures came in at $12.1 million compared to your final budget of $12.4 million. Again, a favorable variance of $361,000. When you come down to the uh, three lines from the bottom, you'll see a net change in fund balance. If I'm looking at the actual column. You'll see $571,000. That represents your revenues that exceeded expenditures for the, for the year. So you're able to add that to your opening fund balance. So your opening fund balance is $4.1 million. You end the year at $4.7 million dollars. So you generated $571,000 in the general fund. Very quickly, if you turn to page 72, it's a snapshot of the balance sheet as of 12-31-2016. Again, the top, your total assets are up about $800,000. Uh, your liabilities are up about $250,000, but that's mainly due to the timing of certain payments. But the balancing number that we just mentioned, the fund balance, is the $4.7 million. And that's broken into four areas or four buckets, if you will. You have certain amounts that are a non-spendable fund balance, and those represent the prepaid expenditures up top. That just means that the town paid certain bills in advance in 2016. Uh, the, the, the cash has gone out the door. The expense has not been recognized. That expense will be recognized next year. You have certain uh, small amount, a uh, residual amount, and the restricted for uh, unexpended law enforcement money. Um, as far as the assigned, those are prior year encumbrances. Uh, those are encumbrances that those, these are current year encumbrances. They will automatically roll and amend next year's budget. And the large number there is your unassigned. Your unassigned is up actually $630,000 as compared to the prior year. Uh, again, another favorable and positive event. We like to compare that unassigned to $4.3 million to your 2017 adopted budget of a little over $15.2 million and your fund balance, your unassigned fund balance is almost 29%, once again, in a healthy position. Um, that gives you, um, that unassigned fund balance is, is free and, and cleared to be used for unexpected uh, circumstances. The town also operates a town outside villages fund for its police and what we call other. Again, those are reported separately, but also combined, if you turn to page 81, a more condensed version, you'll see that I'm looking at the total column in 2016, you'll see that revenues exceeded expenditures by over $928,000. Uh, so once again, another great year in the, in the town outside villages fund. When you add that to the opening fund balance of almost $2.9 million, you end the year at $3.8 million. And once again, if you turn to page 80, you'll see that $3.8 million in total fund balance. Uh, again, that is broken down into three components. Again, you have your non-spendable, you have restricted, and that's also for law enforcement monies. And then you have your assigned fund balance, $2.8 million, and that is actually up a million dollars compared to 2015. Uh, also important to note that the town is using $700,000 of that assigned fund balance to balance the current budget that you're in in 2017. But again, if you take the $2.8 million and divide it by the 2017 adopted budget of $28.1 million, that's about 10%, which is up from 3 or 4% in the prior year. So once again, the town outside villages, mostly in the police area, um, had another great year. We're also going to talk about the sewer fund, which is a major fund of, of the town. Again. If you turn to page 93, if you look at your total revenues, the total revenues came in at $8.6 million compared to your final budget of $8.3 million. Again, a favorable variance of $218,000. Uh, the expenditures also had a favorable variance of $223,000, $8.7 million versus a final budget of $9 million. Uh, the town did appropriate some monies to cover some workers' comp claim, workers' compensation benefit claims. As you can see in the under expenditures in the workers' compensation line, you see that the budget uh, was amended upwards from $172,000 uh, So for the year, for the for the fiscal year, the 
the, the uh, TOV, the sewer fund, I'm sorry, had um, expenditures that exceeded revenues by $177,000. So if you subtract that from the opening fund balance of $2.2 million, the sewer fund ends the year at a little over $2 million. And again, if you turn to page 92, the $2 million is at the bottom there, the total fund balance. Again, those are broken into two components. Again, the non-spendable representing the prepaid expenditures, and you have your unassigned fund balance or your assigned fund balance of $1.8 million, and that's actually down about $170,000. And the town did use $200,000 to balance the current budget year in in 2017. But once again, the $1.8 million divided by the 2017 adopted budget of $8.7 million represents 21%. So once again, a good, healthy fund balance in the sewer fund. The town also operates a highway fund broken into part town and town wide. The combined results are on page 96. Uh, as you can see in, in, the, in the combined uh, section, the, the, the third line from the bottom, the net change in fund balance, actually your expenditures exceeded revenues by $1.1 million. Again, that was anticipated because the, the town did anticipate the use of a million dollars of its own fund balance when it was developing its budget in the adopted budget. Page 95, again, is a snapshot of the balance sheet for the highway fund. And again, you can see at the bottom there the $1.9 million in fund balance, again, broken into two components. Your non-spendable, but the, the larger number there is your assigned fund balance, went from $2.8 million to $1.7 million. So the, the, that is roughly down about a million dollars. But it's also important to note that um, the town is using $800,000 of that assigned fund balance to balance the current budget year in. So I know that uh, Jeff has been closely monitoring the highway fund. Um, so hopefully the, the revenues exceed expenditures next year uh, and you won't have to utilize the, the total $800,000 that you anticipated when you developed the budget. A uh, couple of other areas, the town does operate two golf courses, the Blue Hill Golf Fund and Broad Acres. If you turn to page 121, this is the revenues and expenses of the Blue Hill Golf Course. Again, revenues are pretty comparable to the prior year. They're actually down about $70,000 or so. Uh, expenditures are, are down. Uh, the, the Blue Hill Golf Course was privatized early in 2016. So although you do see savings in the salaries and employee benefits line, there is a slight increase in the contractual area, but overall a savings of about a half a million dollars uh, on the expense side. Uh, when you factor um, before transfers, the, golf, the, the Blue Hill Golf Course Fund did have income of uh, a little over $90,000 when you factor in the transfers that the town made from other funds of uh, another $110,000. The Blue Hill Golf Court had earnings of over $200,000 in 2016. If we look at Broad Acres, Broad Acres on page 124, again, revenues and expenses, the revenues were comparable to the prior year. The expenses were also comparable. They're actually down about $70,000. Uh, Blue Hill, after you factor in some non-operating expenses, had a loss of about $195,000. When you factor in certain transfers made from the town, the total change in net position for the year was, uh, was just uh, $10,000. So the, the Broad Acres Golf Course had a, a loss of $10,000 for the year. Again, from an operating standpoint, when you back out some of the, uh, what we call the non-cash items like depreciation, the operating uh, activities of the, of the golf course funds were uh, profitable for the year. And then lastly, the town does operate two internal service funds for its workers' compensation benefits and its risk retention, which are general liability claims. And on page 127, uh, you'll see a line there in, in the revenue section called charges for services. Uh, the governmental funds of the town charge a premium, uh, you know, or charge the premium um, by the respective uh, internal service funds. So wherever these particular employees fall within the town's funds, those funds are charged a premium to cover uh, certain expenses. 
Uh, as you can see from the workers' compensation and the general liability, uh, particularly the workers' compensation, expenses have been increasing in 2015 and into 2016. However, we have seen a decrease in expenses, at least in the first quarter of 2017, so that's positive news. Um, but because these expenses were increasing over a couple of years, the town did increase its uh, governmental funds contributions uh, to cover these expenses. So although you do see a net change, uh, a change in net position as a bracketed or a negative, if you turn to page 126, um, you can see there's two components in, in the liability section. There's a current portion of claims payable and a non-current portion. The town does hire an actuary to calculate uh, these claims. Um, and and the, really the, non, the, the non-current claims is an estimate of claims that are incurred but not reported. So these are something that the actuary develops. It's not something that the town has to fund currently because they're not really due uh, in, in 2016. So although you see that the net position is a, is a negative number, when you add back these non-current claims, you're, you're at break even. So the town did cover what it had to as far as current claims. That's really it from a financial perspective. If there's any questions. Um, it's nice to be getting good news. Um, and I, and I want to reiterate my appreciation. Um, and just reiterate to the public that's here tonight or maybe watching on TV, um, you know, the budget process is complex and it, and it takes an enormous amount of management by our department heads um, by our finance team, um, and a big part of that is is having a third party like yourselves really um, dive deeply into our books. You know, for anybody who's not here that much, there's a certain time of year when the auditors basically take over this room, and they've all got their laptop computers, and they're going back and forth with finance all day long, mm -hmm. um, reviewing the books, and. And I just think it's important for people to understand that. Um, there's probably not that many people who are going to make a deep dive into this book, but it's actually true. Um, if you look at the book, if you look at the end of the book, where you see 10-year trend data on how many staff we have and what we're spending in different areas, it really does tell you an important story about the town of Orangetown. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, honestly, I think, you know, we've always, you know, we've been very fiscally conservative and, and austere in our spending, and I think you can see the results of that as far as um, the fund balance um, not being depleted, although it's been used, um, staying under the tax cap. The golf is really a huge turnaround um, from several years ago when there was enormous deficits being run up and the town board really rallied and, and made some policy changes there that I think have had an enormous positive effect. Um, in, and I think that you know, you know the workers' comp is definitely a, a cost as far as employees who get injured, and in, in, in some years, unfortunately, are tough years, um, and, and it's a little hard to predict. Um, so I give a lot of credit to our team, and we have a, a safety um, group that gets together um, with the with the departments and with our insurance to to try to f always be looking for ways to prevent uh, worker injuries, and uh, and that helps us with our with our costs and our compliance as well. Um, I guess my, my biggest question is as we go into our budget process for 2018, um, you know, the, the question is essentially is sort of what are the biggest things we should be focused on if there's some kind of corrective we need to make uh, in the way, uh, you know, in the way we're budgeting. If, if there's a highlight you want to give us and to, to the town board yeah, I, I just think, and you, you touched upon it, um, the workers' comp claims. Um, I know Jeff is on top of those, but um, we have seen a decline. And I know that the budget that's developed uh, anticipated a certain increase in funding from the various towns. So that has been increased 20 or 25% a year. Um, so with that coming up and, and the expenses coming down, you're probably at a break-even point. So that's right, I know that's had to be adjusted right. upwards. So that's, that's yeah. a good budgeting process. And I would just, the, the highway fund, again, if, if things turn out the way your budget was developed, you're going to eat into your fund balance. Um, right now it's a, it's a pretty good 
uh, you know, healthy fund balance, but hopefully your revenues exceed your, your budgets and you could kind of monitor your expenses. Uh, we won't be at that point this time next year. Right. Um, members of the town board, any, any quick questions or comments you want to have for auditor? Yeah, we do thank you, and, and we hope that the public, um, if they have detailed kinds of questions, uh, that they you know bring them to us, email us, look at the budget which is posted online, um, take a look at the schedule of, of upcoming budget presentations, which are public presentations by our department heads, and uh, and participate in that. Um, this this audit is is really for the the public's benefit in terms of having a sense of confidence in the town management. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you for you your work sir. on it. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? The uh, CAFR is posted on the town website. Yeah. Right. So the, this, this report is available for the public. Um, there are some towns not far from here where people have to sue the town in order just to get a copy of the town budget that's going to get voted on a week later. So, um, you know, I'm a huge proponent. I know the whole town board is in, in trying to always improve public access and, 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 and transparency. Um, you know, the, the information is there, uh, whether it's in this report or the town budgets which are posted online for people to dig through. Um, and if, if they have suggestions for, for town management, then by all means, let us know. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you, folks. Thank you. Um, with that, I want to turn, because we do have a busy night tonight, um, to our public hearing, uh, our public comment period. And I did have a couple of people sign in. Um, so I'll make a motion to open our public comment period. Do I have a second? Second from Tom Divinity. All in favor say aye. Aye. I have about six people signed up to speak to the town board on pressing matters. Um, nobody actually signed into our public hearing about the historic districts, but I know there's a couple of folks here from the Historic Society, so I'm, I'm hoping that you'll speak. Uh, but on the public comment in general period, uh, the first up would be Carol Adelson from Japan. Is Carol still here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're obviously using your own judgment. Uh, but come on up to the podium. Uh, we welcome public comment. Uh, not all towns do it this way, um, but the town board. Yeah, I didn't know it was out there signing up. I wasn't sure. So I, we have a problem recently. Um, I play tennis at the Independence Park, and uh, recently we were told that uh, we couldn't actually have our friends playing there anymore because they were out of town. And this is one of the issues that has come up. Uh, they would have to pay, I guess, about, what is it, about $150 or something? Can you hear me? Oh. They, in other words, if we were playing with our friends at the park, they'd have to pay about, I think it's 150 is that right? My friend back there, if you're a senior, 150 Yeah. So the, the problem is with the park now, and we were also told that even though we're Orange Town residents, uh, we could only have one guest when we play on the, at the tennis at the park now. Uh, I think the ranger came last week and he said, well, you know, we have, we're gonna have new rules now. If you wanna play tennis there, you can play, uh, you can have one guest, which is kind of restrictive. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a new situation. I've, I'm a resident of the town for 50 years, and this is a brand new situation now. So it's, uh, it's just not comfortable with, uh, you know, the, the new restrictions. Uh, everyone, I think the seniors will have to pay, I think it's $150 now if they want to play, if they don't live in the town. And if I, if I want to play with people from out of the town, um, I'm only limited to one person. So this seems a little... It's a little unfair, you know, for a recreation facility. I think it's, uh, it's very restrictive, and that's, uh, that would be my comment. And I think, you know, we could do something about it. Um, you know, if I have my daughter come and my grandchildren, what do I do? Tell them, sit on the bench. I can only play with one of you. <laughs> one person is allowed. So I think that's my, uh, my main uh, calling here, that it's, it's restrictive, and I, I think it's a little bit unfair. Uh, to, to hold it down that much. I mean, I can see Orange Town residents having preference and maybe, uh, but the, and the fees then, the fees sound to be very high, $150, I think, for a senior to play there if you're out of town. So that's the matter that I, I wanted to address. I don't know, I have somebody with me. Tony, did you want to add anything, Tony? You sure? <laughs> okay, well, that's what I wanted to bring up about the, uh, the tennis Thank, you, Thank you, ma'am. And, um, and we can... Wait, it just if you oh, haven't been here before, 
No, no, go ahead, sit down. Okay. Um, because what we do is, because we don't, you don't have to do a Q and A or a debate when we got a lot of people who have things to say and the town board wants to hear them. So um, what we do is we bring folks up, um, make their comment, and then once everybody's made their comment, um, we try to provide clarifications or answers as is possible um, before we move on to the next thing. Um, but as I said before, folks can always um, email or talk to us offline, uh, come into town hall and get more detail about town policies like the one related to the parks and the residents, um, which, is a, which is a real policy. It's been subject to public debate and, um, and there's a lot of background on that. So the next person up would be um, Al Lucente. Are you here, Al? Great. Thank the board for hearing me. My concern, my concern is about a building that's being built approximately six feet from the back of my property line. My first concern is drainage and land and land grade calculations. The slope of the property is in the direction of my backyard. The gutter and drain will be facing my backyard, where all the roof runoff from this garage and property runoff will collect on my property. Uh, the name of the person is Mr. Ward has indicated to uh, Mr. Mendazer he will be installing a water garden where we don't know. What a water garden is, I've yet to find out. As Mr. M, I'll call Mr. M, recommended, Mr. Ward also indicated that there will be extra soil from the footing and foundation to do the water garden. I do not want another Cherry Brook in Pearl River or in Rockland County. A building inspector spoke with me with Mr. Ward on 11-4 and 11-10 of last year discussing drainage. To date, there are no plans as to where this water garden will reside. It's my understanding that residential developments and commercial property are the only ones that have these type guard water gardens. Uh, and also, we don't know what capacity it'll hold. With the supervisor's retirement, there seems to be no one in charge at, at the building department and details are not acted on. This past Friday, I signed a Freedom of Information Act requesting a copy of the building permit, when today I still had not heard back from the building department. I went there, and the paperwork still wasn't signed. It should not take three days to get this information. Are these employees confused? I don't know. Last Friday, Mr. McPherson, Building Inspector Code Enforcement, came and looked at the work site at my, par at my property and said it was too close to my property and would request Mike, the other building inspector, to issue a stop work order. Mike said no. One says yes, one says no. Who's right? I have reason to believe that the, the surveyor's stake has been moved closer to my property. How does a building permit get issued without a drainage plan? The information I got was the building inspector has the calculations. What they are, I don't know. No neighbors around this, this building have been contacted as to what's going on. I can see no plan for a driveway, which could be almost 100 foot long, where, when a driveway is put in, will that runoff go? The structure is called a shed by Mike from the building department, and originally was 24 by 24 and is now 20 by 20. The license for home improvement states no roofing, no excavating, or subcontracting. Excavation has already been done. The footing has been put in, and tomorrow they'll probably put in the uh, the walls. So you got a, a detailed case and complaint there. Um, we need to deal with it at the staff level. Uh, so maybe you already spoke to Vicky. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, I'll lean court. So I'll, I'll certainly take a look at that tomorrow, uh, and I know you've spoken to my assistant about it, um, and we'll make sure we get your, your questions answered, um, your concerns addressed. Um, there's a level of detail that I don't think we're gonna be able to respond to at this meeting, um, but we hear you loud and clear. I hope so. Thank you. I'm, I'm just worried about the water that's gonna be accumulating. Yep. Okay, thank you. Get it, thank you. Um, Esther Baitler. Good evening, Supervisor Stewart and town board members. Hi, my name is Esther Baitler. I live at Ventures Park Hill. Tonight I want to speak to all of you 
regarding the night of the, of the workshop meeting. I watched you all on my TV. I was embarrassed how all of you acted at this meeting. Alan Riff kept asking you guys, can we move this meeting along? Can we move this meeting along? No one gave him any sort of a stimulus response. That's not right. Alan deserves respect like everybody else. He does a great job and people should be giving him dignity and respect. I could not believe how people acted. I was mortified. Um, when you plan to have a workshop meeting, you need to come up with a longer agenda. It was over within 15 minutes. That's just ludicrous. Um, number two, okay. Um, as a consumer who lives at Venture, I have been asking all of you for a bus shelter. I spoke with Stefan, and his answer was in a very nice way. We have to wait till later on in the fall. We have to wait for the DOT. That's called business money passing the buck. That's not right. I don't think you guys understand what venture is about. Without me, without Dennis, nobody could run it like I can. I, I really feel that maybe we should take the bus shelter that Shelley Morgan suggested from Rockland Psych. I, I, when are you guys going to do something? All right. I, I think it, it's really not right. Andy, you told me you would call the county. You never got back to me. Why? I would like some answers. All right, thank you, Esther. I know. I just yeah. want to thank we Jim Dean for all he's done to help move our Venture Foundation down to 340. So thank you, Jim. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Esther. Uh, Michael Mandel, Pearl River. I think I got a copy already. Good evening, Supervisor Stewart, members of the town board. For the record, my name is Michael Mandel, resident of Pearl River. At the last meeting, Councilman Valentine stated that uh, many of the building departments in the tri-state area he has had business with have computerized their departments, thereby applications and so forth can be completed and submitted online. Has the town conducted a cost-benefit analysis yet? Was this proposal, uh, if cost effective, would save the residents time and money, and thank you for making that proposal. Regarding the position of director of the buildings department, I hope the individual selected will be based on best qualified, and not because the town board is being lobbied by a specific individual or group. And if any member of the board has conducted business for, or had individual work for them, or collaborated with that person, either in the past or currently, that person should recuse himself from the selection process. Further, in order not to embarrass any of the four remaining candidates, I'm, not, uh, I'm more than willing to discuss it with any more board member after the meeting. Okay, it should be a licensed engineer, and the last uh, planning board meeting we had, they mentioned uh, reports had to be submitted by licensed engineer, I think on at least five of the projects. We need somebody that can understand those and review those. Finally, regarding item seven, the current homestead base proportions and adjusted base proportions. The base proportion affects the homestead non-homestead tax rates, that is residential and commercial properties, and shifts the tax rate between them from year to year. If what I am saying seems a little confusing, it is. The Pearl River School District 
residents will see their school taxes increase by 4.42% this year, based on a homestead rate of 39.693367. I won't bore you with any of the other numbers. Where is our assessor who stated would be here at tonight's meeting? Out of state, not here. He should be here to explain the numbers and answer taxpayers' question, including why has Clarkstown had a bill passed in Albany, submitted by Senator Colucci, who is also our state senator, and Assemblyman Zimbrowski, which was signed by the governor that limits the shift between residential and commercial properties to no more than 1% a year. The assessor, Brian Kenny said he went to Albany to reduce the equalization rate increase of 14%, which affects the base proportion and our tax rate or increase. Did he or anyone bother to speak with our neighboring towns or Senator Colucci about the problem and what they were doing? I don't think so. And Assemblywoman Jaffe, who in my opinion seems only concerned with Ramapo constituents, not Orangetown. Maybe some of the board members can answer the questions about the uh, different rates. And they're all uh, go six digits uh, past the decimal point. Kenny should have been here. You're voting on something that he's not here to explain. I think that uh, it's about time that we should have this done. We the taxpayers, because every other department head is here, and so should he. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mandel. Um, Deborah Stuhl Weissenberg. Good evening. How are you doing? Welcome to Town Hall, yeah. obviously. I think I'd like to just give that, if you don't mind, we'll give that to Dennis, and maybe we can just pass those pictures, that file. If we could, I'm sorry. Can we just give it to Dennis? And those are just some samples of what I'm going to be discussing. Okay, great. I'm Debbie Stu Weisenberg. I live in Tepan, and this is Paul. Hi, I'm Stuart and Ward. I'm, I'm Paul Borghese. I also live in Tepan. So we're here tonight just to discuss with you and, and bring up some questions and concerns that we have about the appearance of what Orange Town is starting to, is looking like. And um, I know, Mr. Stewart, we've talked about this in the past. We mm -hmm. tried to formulate a group about a year ago, um, just discussing some of the things that we feel are no longer being kept the way they should be kept, trimmed back. Um, I think what prompted us to be here this evening was this median right here on Orangeburg Road and the way that that turned out. Um, and I brought, we brought some pictures to show you some of the things that we just feel are not being um, addressed by the town. I haven't seen cone enforcement around in a while. We have people putting trash out when it's a month before their due date. And so we're gonna ask the board to take a look at this and see if they can respond in some way that once again, is there something we can do to make Orange Town look the way Orange Town once looked once before? And I'm going to let Paul speak and give his concerns. Well, I, I moved up here in uh, 1968 from the Bronx, lived here for quite a while. Then I lived in New York City for a number of years, and I came back a few years ago. I moved back here about five or six years ago, and I was kind of surprised a little at a time what I'd been seeing in Orange Town. I just remember it being much more beautified. And you cross over into the Jersey line, and you, you just see such a difference. And I found it rather amusing that there's, a, that there's a ranger that's out there maybe checking IDs uh, to, you know, to collect fees for, to play tennis, but yet some of the grounds uh, that you pass uh, when you're jogging or walking you know, are just in, in terrible condition. You, know, you go up, up and down Western Highway or Orangeburg Road, and like last year, the median had, I know someone made a donation, so I do not want to slight a donation in anyone's memory, but we had those sunflowers that just turned into a wall of weeds, and they were dangerous because people you know, could not see oncoming traffic. If somebody crossed the lane, you would not see them coming. You wouldn't be able to avoid them. And uh, also at deers, people were hitting deer that were crossing through. They didn't see them coming. And then this year when I saw them doing the work, I said, wow, maybe they're going to put pavers. They're going to do something. And the next thing we see is these construction rocks that everybody's been talking about. I, I mean, I don't know where that design came from, but it would be nice if it's the first thing that people see when they get off exit 6C e or 6W is that median and that section of Orangetown. And, and that's what you see is a, is a pile of rubble. And uh, sooner or later, they're going to fall onto the street. Cars are going to hit them. There's going to be damage. And again, like Deborah was saying, uh, people are putting out, you know, at the end of the month, there's a pickup. People are putting stuff out. We have photographs. I mean, people are putting stuff out at the beginning of the month, the middle of the month. You can't drive down any of our roads in Orangetown without seeing junk and garbage and chairs. Uh, 
so I guess it's the gong show. I'm done, but <laughs> but we would love to do something yeah. about it and participate. We're not just complaining. We're here to be proactive and say, is there anything we can do to help or see what you might be able to suggest? Yeah, no, and you've identified a couple, I think, real eyesore issues. So thank you. Um, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Hey, we appreciate your time. Absolutely. Um, Larry Vale. Uh, you know, I'm here actually for the hearing. I'm okay. Official. I just wait. Until yeah. If you're on the historic, um, by a raise of hands, anybody else here for general town board comments? Yes, ma'am. Hi, first, my name is Barbara Dello, and first I wanted to ask for even-handed watching of the clock in cutting off resident speakers. Um, that being said, I think I'm in my time. Um, a couple weeks back, I brought in um, a letter to all of you asking uh, for you to focus on the needs of the seniors in our community. Um, and given the demographic shift towards a larger percentage of seniors and the extraordinarily small percentage of our town budget dedicated to the needs of this population, has the town considered focusing on the needs of this population with our Support Our Seniors initiative? doing simple things like highlighting our seniors and in um, the displays on town hall, uh, instituting specialized training for our emergency workers to meet the needs of our most frail, dedicating a town employee to look into special concerns of this population, their most pressing needs, and um, you know, even none of this requires a lot of resources, but even maybe looking at the town budget and seeing if it's really right that such a disproportionately low amount of money is dedicated to this very important part of our town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else here for general public comment? Yes, Mr. Morgan. Watson Morgan, uh, Blowville, New York. I am not Shelley Morgan. Uh, I'm the one who brought, it, brought the comment up about moving the bus shelter because the bus 20 moved and this bus shelter is, is there and there's probably several at Rockland State that are public shelters that potentially could be moved to the location. Just put it on a truck and move it over there. Uh, I don't see why that really needs a lot of attention. Uh, the other thing that I want to speak about, the uh, people who talked about where they lived over by Independence Park, where, Park and wanting to have some friends over and visit. And the, 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 the methodology that we have, have put in place is, is, in my opinion, haphazard and should be maybe five, 10, 20 pages long to cover all the issues. Uh, I've asked some people perhaps to look at the model that they have up in the town of Haverstraw where all the residents who want to participate in recreation can participate perhaps with a $100 uh, family membership for the year. And that would entitle them to certain privileges of parking and admittance to the park and also that money would go towards uh, dedicated beautification for parks and such. Uh, it would also allow them to petition the recreation department uh, for a nominal fee that residents, that friends could come to the park for a nominal fee of perhaps $3 a head or $2, not something where we have to have somebody pay $250 or $175 to, to use a park. And they, they also have to notify the parks before, so it's like a catch-22 situation. Uh, I would soon strongly recommend that you look much more seriously at the Haverstraw proposal for really good parks. Uh, over the years, the last 20, 25 years, I've seen the Haverstraw park system grow and get much, much better. There's now uh, beautiful walkways. They've added uh, comfort stations in other parts of the park where they weren't. They do have a pool, but that is something that would be a, that's a, second, a separate uh, thing on top of your regular park membership. But I, I think you should really seriously look at something like that. And there, there's things like that all over the country. And uh, I, I think this, 
the plan that we have is haphazard and sometimes very differently uh, applied. Thank you. Thank you, Watson. Um, anybody else for public comment? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Tony Adams. I'm a, I live in Pearl River, and um, I'm a friend of Carol over there who talked earlier. And this is, again, this is in reference to the parks and as far as in the tennis playing, okay? And, um, oh, well, I think it is unfair that you're charging uh, senior citizens. I know they're not town residents, but you're charging them $150 to come and, and play tennis at the local parks. They come, they've been coming there for years. They've been coming there for 30 years, some of them. And they come and it's like a, a way for them to get exercise and socialize. And uh, it's, it's, it's great for our seniors, even though they're not Orange Town residents. So I, th I think that charging $150 is way too much for these people who are, who are, are living uh, um, you know, <coughs> on more or less a fixed income. <clears throat> and the fact that um, being an Orange Town resident, I can only bring um, one friend, okay? Now, we talked to the park ranger. I think if, if it's a family member, you can bring your family. And they say, well, how are you going to know it's a family member, okay? It's like my sister lives in Florida. She comes up to visit me. She's not, she's not an Adams. She's a Solomon. And the ranger says, you're going to have to show ID. And it has to be um, Adams on the ID, which can't be done in that case, okay? Um, well, yeah, basically, um, that's what I have to say. Um, thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, for your comments. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we, if we're not seeing other hands waving, um, that we close the first public comment period. Moved. I uh, have a motion from Divini, second from over here. Jerry, all in favor say aye. Aye. Um, maybe we should respond briefly to some of these questions that have been raised no. all right. uh, before we get into our, as our next public hearing. As far as the parks law, the park law, I helped write it. It does not say that you have to pay money if you're a guest of a town resident. So town residents can bring family members and guests, and they're not charged. So I don't know where that's coming from. And it specifically says that on the town website. We, because we went through a number as long as the residents there. of versions of this law. As Paul said, as long as the town residents there, they can bring their family members and guests if they're non-residents. That's the law that we pass, and that's the law that is on the books. So maybe there's a little miscommunication. But what was just said is completely incorrect. Eric, you want to talk? Yeah. Eric is in charge of Parks and Rec, but that is not the law that we passed. So just to clarify the specific situation we were discussing with regard to the tennis courts at Independence yesterday. All right. I, I spoke to Ms. Adelson yesterday. I spoke to our park ranger. Uh -huh. um, I guess first thing, you know, he, I guess he did have some conversation with them at the courts yesterday. He didn't ask them to leave. He didn't remove them from the courts. I think he was he felt a little uncomfortable based on the conversation taking that action. He came back to me to get clarification on you know on the guest policy because I guess he wasn't he wasn't sure you know the way I I feel it should be applied and I and I kind of thought we were doing this go you know all along was the resident can bring guests to play tennis if the resident is on a court whether they have one two or three guests with them they're using one court. What's the difference if they have one, two, or three guests? I'm fine with that. If the guests, though, are moving off and taking up other courts, if those, if those guests are moving off, taking up other courts, you know, in other words, if your guest has to be with you in the park. Your guest can't be somewhere right. else. Exactly. That's, you know, and I think we've clarified that now. I think all of our rangers are, are on board with that. Okay. So Good. I don't see an issue. Okay? Thank you, Eric. Yep. Thanks, Eric, for the clarification. Um, that's all I really wanted to clarify. Um, other town board members? Yeah, I'd like to go. Mike, I got to be honest. Sometimes you get with a group of like to insult people. 
And the fact that you would question any one of our judgment as far as who we're picking, I'm gonna pick the best person for the town. I work in construction. There's not an engineer or an architect that lives in this county or town that I have not worked with. And I will pick the best person for the job regardless of whether I worked with them or not. And I don't plan on recusing myself because I'm picking the best person for the town. We're not accusing Paul. Um, okay. Also, just made a statement, that's all. You know, it's a pretty general statement, but basically going at all of us up here. Um, I don't feel, and I disagree with you wholeheartedly, that an engineer is required. Engineers aren't required in Clarkstown. An engineer shouldn't be engineering somebody's project. They're supposed to hire their own engineer for that. If our town employee overrides their engineer drawings and something happens, guess who's liable? The town employee and the town and me and you. So we don't need an engineer to check people's drawings to see if they were engineered properly. They're supposed to be hiring their own person. Our code enforcement officers are supposed to be making sure that they follow New York State Building Code, New York State Energy Code, that they're following the code requirements, that they have a sealed engineer drawing from a licensed engineer in the state. They shouldn't be checking to see if the load calculations are correct. And I wouldn't want them to do that because then I become liable as a resident for what their decisions are. So I think that someone who knows the building code is much more important to me, someone who can run a good department and someone who can make it run more efficiently is more important to me than having a college degree in one uh, uh, disciple or another. And there are many types of engineer. You can be an engineer that only worked on big bridges and would know nothing about residential building code you can be an engineer that only works on environmental engineering. That doesn't mean you know anything about building code. You can be one that knows about flood mitigation but not about construction. So just saying I want an engineer to me does not hold water. So I'm gonna pick the best person for the town out of the um, resumes and the interviews that we've held. Um, am I right? Um, I just want to affirm basically the validity of a couple of people speaking tonight. Number one, um, uh, Deborah and Paul, you know, you're, there's always the need to go out and tackle eyesores, and the ones that you showed pictures of, I think, uh, deserve attention. And, and so I appreciate you bringing that up, but I know that you share all of our concern with beautification and how it affects appearance, translates into property values, translates into how people behave. Their likelihood of littering is dependent in part on whether there's a trashy environment. Um, I think we do work hard on these. There's always room for improvement, and I thank you for pointing out areas where we need to take a look. Um, the, I also just wanted to mention on, you know, Michael Mandel, you started on the, on the tax issue, and as you point out, there really, there's a lot of math behind that. There's a lot of issues behind that. Um, I, I want to caution you um, against making sort of accusations of, of fault um, for one thing, you mentioned Ellen Jaffe. You know, you know. I wish Brian Kenny were here tonight too. By the way, he's on vacation. Um, the that he would be here tonight. That he would be here. Okay, so we were advised that he would be here tonight. So, so that there, there is a concern there. Um, this, the issue of the equalization rate has been under scrutiny and been the topic of advocacy by both Brian, you know, through Ellen Jaffe's office, through the school districts. As you're probably aware of this. For, for probably the better part of, of six or seven months. Um, and and there, there really are um, issues that call for attention and reform at the state level because of the way the calculations are done. Um, the town has submitted a complaint. It is following up on it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of information there for people to have. Um, and Clarkstown did swing a deal um, with, with a home rule legislation, which, which I wish um, that concept had been shared because I think it does have some validity, although it's not necessarily all that it makes itself out to be, <laughs> you know, um, but it is something that, that we should look at and we are looking at. And I talked with Ellen Jaffe about this, uh, I think, yesterday or the day before. 
with their staff. So, so it's an issue. Um, We appreciate, we appreciate a little more um, information forthcoming from that end, there's no doubt about it. And I know George Holman well, and he didn't mention it to me either, so go figure. Um, but anyway, I do appreciate you bringing it up. Um, and it really is an issue related to the state and their, the way they calculate property values. And it affects the, the town residents who live in the split school districts, the Nanuet or Nyack, um, and, the, and, and our staff have been <laughs> working really hard to try to get the state to change um, their numbers and you know they, they, we will put forward um, probably a more you know you know a sort of reform proposal not unlike Clarkstown's but a little more a little more broad than that so um, but I appreciate you bringing that up um, uh, and I just want to give kudos to, to Barbara you know the, the focus on the seniors I think is a great idea and um, I don't want you to you know, we don't have the capacity to pick up every single flag and run with it. Um, it is a really important issue. The, the town really does invest a lot, um, and, and so do many other agencies, as you're aware. But, the, but there's always the need, uh, and, and we have an aging demographic, and there are a lot of seniors in our community, and they do have special needs and diverse needs. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of our town effort, um, because we serve the public, is driven by senior needs as well as other people. Uh, when you look at a lot of the work the police department does, a lot of it's basically driven by medical aid. Um, you look at the senior clubs and the money that goes into renting facilities and, and the meetings and the, and the recreation and so on. Um, you look at parks, um, you know, we try to be as responsive as possible, um, but I don't think anybody's gonna say uh, or disagree with you <laughs> that it's, it's important to do more. And I appreciate you bringing that up and you did it in a very, a very nice, uh, and I think a, a very well articulated way. Um, so I think that's probably all we can say on these specific topics for right now. Um, I want to make a motion to start our public hearing on the historic code change. Um, so I'll make a motion to open that public second, hearing. Second. Uh, I got a second from Tom Diveny. There's, there's the, the, the uh, all in favor say aye. aye. So we're opening the public hearing. Um, amending Chapter 43, Article 3, Section. Sorry. Yeah, we're going to have to carry on the conversation outside the meeting. We can't go into detail and have conversation about every single thing. Sorry, I can't even hear what you're saying. I responded as well as I could to the issues that are presented, and, and you know where I stand on litter issues. So. Um, but I'd be happy to follow up with you. Um, the, the, um, the matter at hand, and we do have a lengthy agenda for tonight, and I think people appreciate that, um, has to do with a lot of work has gone into to, um, what is, you know, it, it's meaningful, um, it, but it's also fairly modest. But it's, these are corrections that need to be done. Um, and so there's a proposal on the table for uh, amending the town code. It's come through um, committee has been involved uh, with some of the folks sitting here. Uh, I want to hear what anybody has to say about it. Um, and, uh, but I, wa I want to start just by summarizing it um, in, 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 the, in the most sort of brief terms because we've had several workshop meetings, we've had presentations. Um, but essentially, um, the historic areas are guided by town law and the, the, the sense is that some small changes to that law are overdue. Um, one of them has to do with um, boosting somewhat the notification related requirements for proposed demolition of older structures in the historic area. Um, so the language addresses that and actually having a demolition permit on certain structures of a certain age be subject to uh, you know, it being on the historic area board of review agenda. Um, and when something's on the agenda and it's discussed publicly, people have more chance to learn about it. Um, so that's one of them. And then the other changes have to do with, with the sign regulations, uh, the neon signs, and, 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 and defining what a monument sign is and clarifying the town code with respect to certain kinds of signs so that so people would know um, when commercial buildings are putting up a sign, you know, what's, what's allowed and what isn't. And it would prohibit neon signs in the historic area. So that's basically the, the, the gist, the, the, the full text 
other proposals um, have been published several times and they're in the town board agenda for tonight. Um, I got a, a question for you, Andy. Go ahead. It says that uh, who desired to tear down a structure be reviewed and decided upon by the, the Historic Areas Board Review at a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they can deny the right to demolition a building? Um, you know, I don't want to you know, speak from the lawyer point of view. But my understanding is is no, actually. The, but, but why don't we have the... Well, I'm just that's a clarification. I, you know, right, it, right now, instead of the permit being... I just read it, and yeah. it, it seems that if you're waiting for a decision, then that dis it's not... The decision could be that you don't have the right to demolition that building. Um, my understanding is that that's not the case, but the decisions can be taken in various ways and the, and that the idea is for people to have a chance to know what's going on. Um, but I do think, I understand that demolition is a right, but it's, but it's not a right that's, that's necessarily subject to being done unilaterally or without public notification. I'm not um, arguing that. I think right. there should be public notification, but I'm just saying right. the way I read it, and maybe John, you can weigh in on this, it, it seems like that this gives them the right to deny it. Am I right or am I wrong? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But. Well, that's a useful clarification. It is something that we talked about before. So, you know, Denise Sullivan, our town attorney, a deputy, also put a lot of work into this. Um, John G. put work into it. We have the Historical Society. We have Alan Riff here. I'm not uh, arguing yeah. that. I'm just saying, as an attorney, the way I read it, if there's going to be a decision, I agree it should be reviewed. I, I agree there should be a posting, posting a and a waiting time. but. Mm -hmm. The, the, it should be reviewed, but by saying and decided upon at a public hearing, to me that would indicate there's a possibility, and maybe you guys can get up here and just and, and 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 tell us what is. It's there's a possibility that there might be a decision that the demolition is going to be denied based on the, the way I'm reading this it's this language. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have one question on the table. Uh, um, <laughs> I invite you to, to respond to that Gee, thanks. Or, or speak to uh, the public hearing. Uh, Councilman, uh, you're correct. Uh, I don't think it was the uh, idea that the Historic Area Board of Review could say yay or nay over the demolition. I, I don't think that it would have that right. But it was the idea that it would just add another layer uh, of protection to old buildings, uh, a public forum where people could get up uh, and tell the applicant, you know, the importance of the building and uh, why it, it should remain. Essentially, the idea was to uh, give these historic buildings their last best chance of, of uh, existence. Uh, all, all I can say is that, you know, my wife and I bought our house in 1969. It was built in 1860. Uh, it's gotten older. We've gotten older. Uh, I don't think there's a right angle in the place. If uh, a modern building is built that way, it's called a uh, building fault or design flaw. In older buildings, it's called character. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is keep the character of Orangetown uh, and its old buildings uh, alive. Uh, so the more that we can do to uh, protect these old buildings in, in, you know, in the face of being torn down, I think the better. Uh, certainly, uh, word would get around that uh, it is not just easy to tear down an old building and put something else up in its place in Orange Town, in the historic, I'm sorry, in the historic di districts. Uh, that, uh, that would get around and give people pause who want to come in here uh, buy a building in the historic district and then and then tear it down and put a new building up in its place. That would that was the purpose of it. Okay. Uh, it wasn't the purpose to give uh, the HABR uh, the power to say no. So if we just took out where it says be reviewed by the historic area review, review at a public hearing, it would work, not and yeah. decided upon. So that's we right. Take out and decided upon. That 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 would be helpful. That would work. Okay. Thank then, you. But oh. it, no, just because we got to make it consistent. Then, it, in addition, a 90 day waiting period shall begin on the day the, it says the decision. Would it be the approval is filed or? Well, the hearing. 
No, no, it's it's it, this is the, the waiting period. It says in addition, a 90-day waiting period shall begin on the day of the, the hearing. I, I would imagine the uh, decision is filed with the town clerk. Usually, that's when the time to uh, a waiting period will begin. So, how do you want that to read? Uh, 90 days from the the hearing. The hearing? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, I think you got to take decision now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all right, John's going to win. I'm positive that works, but, yeah. I, 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 but, but I, I'm not sure how it works, Tom. In response to your initial question, I don't really read it that way. But I guess it's unclear enough that it should be uh, be clarified. Well, I, I can, however you want to clarify. I confess <laughs> I have not uh, worked on this, and uh, mea culpa. Um, so what's the, the question is, what is the ultimate uh, intention? I thought when discussions uh, first started on this issue, people wanted a waiting period between the issuance of a demolition permit and demolition. Obviously, giving somebody who may have standing to, uh, to object to take whatever action uh, you know, may be warranted. Now, this provides for a, a public hearing. Now, we can say, you know, public hearing or 90 days, what is the decision? Is it simply a public hearing where people have the ability to uh, air their uh, grievances, their beliefs, their support, or whatever? Or is it intended for the board as a body then to make a decision and a recommendation? I don't see that here. John, can I ask a question? Yeah. I mean, I know we make a distinction between a public hearing per se and just simply the meeting of the Historic Area Board of Review. Um, it's my understanding that it, the intent of this is to make the demolition permit an item on the Hay Board's meeting agenda so that anybody who was watching those agendas would know what was going on. Uh, but not to, not to have a different kind of public hearing so I don't know if that, those words, public hearing, are, are used in some sort of kind of legal sense. My understanding is it's just well, supposed this to be on the meeting me, agenda. This strikes me, no. I mean, this, this strikes me as more in the nature of a, uh, a legally noticed public hearing uh, as opposed to an agenda item. This has to be published. There's at least a five days, uh, I mean, it's not 10 as some, but five days is consistent but, with the town law for some applications. And has to be filed with the It's clerk. a legally noticed public hearing in default of which the proceeding is flawed and something, whatever it is, you know, could result. You know, typically that would be the basis for a, uh, a, a lawsuit challenging an approval or a denial. I don't see an approval or denial being a part of this. I see, as you're saying, Andy, this is you know a, a matter on the public agenda. People get to uh, get up, they get to speak. The board's not going to make a decision, although the last sentence would suggest otherwise, but it doesn't say what that decision is, whether it is in fact the denial of the demolition, it's simply a referral or a recommendation to the building inspector not to issue the permit. It's, 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 not, it's not at all clear. I, I just, what I, I thought was, was intended back at the beginning was thou shalt not, not knock down certain structures before people have had the opportunity to comment, and there's a waiting period which implies to take some form of action, action within that. Or work out some kind of deal right. or what have you. Something. And, and I get it, that. Having yeah. it on the agenda for a public meeting is in some ways I think the most efficient way of inviting and, and notifying people that well, the matter is being considered. It allows, it allows there to be public comment right. and then have that period of time 
to take action, as John said, or, you know, call the owner of that property and try to make a deal. You know, I would, I would just remind the board on that, you know, and we're thinking maybe about what happened with the Seth House a year or so ago. There, there are many options besides simply opposing a demolition. You know, if a property owner has the right to demol demolish a place, um, the timing of that, the opportunity to discuss with the owner in terms of salvaging elements of the existing architecture, of, of, of selling materials or having them be put into use in other places, um, those are the kind of conversations that can happen all within the context of a property owner having the right to demolition. Um, and the town has a permit process for demolition already, so nobody's suggesting that per demolition should be done um, sort of unilaterally. The only question is, like, what is, what is the best way to advance the public interest in knowing something's happening and, and perhaps offering an alternative view or an option to an owner as to, is, hey, you know, those, those, the doorstepper, those columns, uh, you know, there's something that has a lot of value. Um, have you considered keeping it? Have you considered selling it? Have you considered donating it? Those kinds of questions can come up all within the context of the fact that the guy has the right to tear it down if he wants to. Um, so, so that, I think, is the nature of it. It wasn't necessarily to have a specifically different kind of public hearing. Um, the notifications of a meeting in general, I think, would be sufficient. Uh, sorry, go ahead. You can clarify yes. this. But I want to clarify my understanding, anyway, of, of where this is. I, I think the problem has to do partly with the word decision by the historic board. Right, yes. that's what Mr. Dibby was pointing to. Because perhaps if instead of saying that from the decision of the historic board, from the hearing at the historic board. Mm -hmm. Because the time, for instance, the land house, with extra time, that house could have been saved. There had been plans to save it, but there wasn't time. Or the or more time you give, it, yeah. the more publicity, the more possibilities there are for saving a house. But I agree the decision is confusing. It's a little confusing. <laughs> so, so maybe we can correct that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, Alice didn't introduce herself, but that's Alice Gerard, who's well known for her work uh, in historic preservation and palisades, and and uh, and she and Alan and others uh, have really contributed a lot to um, figuring out how to to um, make amendments that make sense. Um, I think we're very close. So on this matter, you know, before we continue the discussion, is there anybody else here who wants to speak on the, on the, the matter at hand and, and, and maybe offer clarifying comments? Um, because we sort of got into discussion. Um, I think it's clear. I think yeah. it's just got to be, it's, gotta, it's clear what the intent is. It's the intent has to make it into this particular paragraph. Mm -hmm. Basically, you got to take on anything with precision, and it works. And, uh, yeah, I see those edits. I understand but that. Yeah. Um, but it, from the public, yes, Larry. Let me go with Larry first, then Bob, uh, who's going to take off his journalist hat and put on his his uh, town policy. Oh, hat. My, mine is uh, uh, Larry Vale uh, Tepan. Um, mine is quite brief. Um, I'm here representing the Tapan Town uh, Historical Society tonight because Carol Laval could not be here, but you should all have a copy of her letter, which is in support of this. I know that um, a number of members of the Historical uh, Society um, w worked very hard on this and appreciate all the effort from all the other people and the town staff, and this has been going on for a long time. And so I'm just here to say that the, uh, the board uh, fully supports this and is uh, looking forward to its adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, Bob Knight, uh, welcome to John's the podium. John's in the Scrivener mode. Yeah. He's, hmm. he's doing some edits. John's doing third year law school. <laughs> you mean one of the degrees in writing? Uh, <laughs> Bob Knight. I'm uh, speaking as a, an official town historian for the neighboring town of Clarkstown and chairman of the Historical Review Board in the town of Clarkstown. Uh, I'm in favor of the changes that are being proposed. Uh, my only suggestion would be they don't go quite far enough in certain areas. There's a couple of I, I think and have always thought a couple of glaring loopholes. Um, the number one being that it only pertains to the two historic districts in Tapan and Palisades, uh, which are 
relatively small in size. They do contain a number of historic buildings, uh, but well over half of the historic buildings in Orangetown are outside of those two districts and are not covered in any way whatsoever. Uh, another glaring error, I think, and I stand to be corrected on this one, but from what I've been able to find out so far, the town itself is exempt from uh, demolition permits on its own property, and therefore, in a move that caught a lot of people by surprise, the town two weeks ago tore down one of its most historic houses, uh, built, I think, about 1810 uh, at the Blue Hill Golf Course, uh, and that was done with no public comment, no public hearing, no demolition permit, no nothing to nobody. The only way people found out about it was they drove by and saw the bulldozers knocking it down. Uh, I checked the minutes at the town board meetings and couldn't find anything in the minutes authorizing it. Apparently, if, if it was done at all, it was done, uh, I guess, in executive session. I don't quite know. That's incorrect. No, there was public we put discussion. It out, we put it out to bid. On that part of it. We put it out to bid, and we got... Uh, Mary was informed about it. That's, right. that's completely Somehow incorrect. Somehow I missed it, because I, I think I've been at every single meeting, and I don't remember it No. Uh, you yeah, missed, missed it, but, missed but, but the point is understood anyway. And, but did the town give itself a demolition permit? No. Uh, no. Because I, 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 I couldn't find one. I looked for one and couldn't yeah. find one. And I, I think that is one of the errors in what uh, I would think should be in this ordinance. In Clarkstown, we do re require it, and the town itself must give itself a demolition permit if they want to tear down the historic structures that the town owns. Yeah. Apparently, the, the, apparently the, we did get a building permit from ourselves to demolish the thing. So thank you, Vicki, for that correction. <laughs> I know there was extensive discussion, um, but I appreciate your point. I mean, and, and I think it's a point well taken. That this rule is applied narrowly to the historic areas. Um, people might ask about historic or old homes and other places outside. Um, the rules proposed don't address that. That's for future, for future work. Um, so that's how I would respond to that. Um, yes, Carol. Johnny Law, you got anything? Yeah, just let's let have her. She's, if you could just introduce yourself and. and uh, Hello, my name is Claire Sheridan, and I am a Tapan resident, and I am the chair of the Historic Preservation Committee at the County Historical Society. I just want to thank um, everybody on the committee for all the work that has been done so far, and certainly the town staff especially. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Um, I concur with Bob Knight that um, there are some needs to address historic structures outside of the historic districts. So uh, by no means are we finished. Um, I think our committee will continue to meet and start and discuss how we can protect um, structures outside of the historic districts. Um, I think that uh, I'm here just to say that on behalf of the Historical Society of Rockland County and the Historic Preservation Committee, we support these changes as well. Um, and just to clarify, what, what we were trying to go for was uh, an opportunity for the Historic Areas Board of Review to have um, a chance to review demolition permits on historic structures and then give the public an opportunity to know about that demolition permit request uh, in a public way and to have an opportunity to intervene if there was uh, someone or some group that would be willing to do that. So um, perhaps the word decision isn't the right word, but certainly we want the Historic Areas Board of Review to review and make a um, maybe not a the decision's the right word, but a recommendation, perhaps, is to, mm -hmm. um, because we know that Habor isn't going to um, that might be the word. issue permits or deny permits, but they certainly could make a recommendation for or against a permit. So that's really the, the intent, I think, um, and I hope that clarifies, but overall, uh, these are, uh, we support these. Thank you so much. And thanks for your work on it. Thank you. Claire. It's Claire. Yeah. Claire. Claire. 
but I think I said Carol before him. It's Claire. You're on behalf of the Rockland County Critical Historic Preservation? No, I'm actually here on behalf of the His Historical Society of Rockland County and the uh, committee of that organization for historic preservation. Different, different from, from the County Preservation Board, correct. <laughs> um, anybody else here? Yes, John Mary Matt Cardenas. I'm Mary Cardenas. I'm the Orange Town historian. How many times have I sat here or I've walked through um, various communities, uh, historic areas, and I see a house being improved. We have people who come into Orangetown, rich in history. They love the community. They love the historic areas. They buy a parcel of land. They proceed to tear the house down and improve the community. This is one of the things I think we're trying to work to preserve. We're not against demolition by any means. There are times when a house has to be taken down. It has severe damage. It has termite damage. Who knows what? The point is, people should not come in and just objectively just tear down the house. That's not what this is about. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, anybody else here to speak on this specific matter? And then we'll get back to the discussion. Hopefully, we'll get the edit right. Um, Alan? I uh, just want to say thank you to the committee for all their hard work. I think that uh, Carol, Carol LaBelle, in her letter, is very clear as to the intent involving uh, demolition. And just to read it very briefly, the changes dealing with the demolition of structures in the historic areas provides a clearer notification and review process for considering the application for demolition. Very important, it also provides a clear time frame in which efforts to save or move any elements of historic and aesthetic value can be made. It does not prevent demolition from occurring, but it does offer much needed review of the proposal and consideration of alternatives to demolition if appropriate and possible. Again, I want to thank the committee for their hard work over the last year and a half. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. It's, it is too bad Carol couldn't be here, but I think her words do provide a lot of um, clarity on that purpose. Um, anybody else to speak on the on the public hearing matter? All right. All right. Um, to close so we have a motion to close public portion from Dom Diveny. Um, second over here, from Dennis Troy. All in favor, say aye. 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 And, and just to clarify, aye. I don't think anyone is against the changes. It's just we're trying to get the right language that takes the intention and puts it so that it's clear in this uh, paragraph section 2H, you know. So, so John, were you, were you kind of figuring on, on some fine tuning of the edits the town board is considering in well, the last few minutes? What I think uh, gets where, gets where um, you want to be, if I understand it. So what I would do is strike the last sentence of paragraph A. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, H. the next of H, the next to last mm -hmm. sentence. Take out, in addition, a 90-day waiting period uh, shall begin on the day the decision is filed with the town clerk. I think uh, based on what I will now propose, that's uh, redundant. Right, the last sentence basically says the same thing. Okay. And so uh, take that out, and then it should read, uh, the demolition permit shall not be issued until 90 days shall have passed following the date on which a public hearing shall be conducted and closed. Now, I just added in close because I'm assuming it could last more than one session uh, if the board uh, were to so decide. So when the hearing is closed, everyone has had the opportunity to uh, offer their views. There's a 90-day waiting period within which someone can take 
whatever action uh, he, she, or they may think is appropriate. Um, uh, but on day 90, uh, in the absence of some action uh, by a court or another board having jurisdiction, uh, uh, the permit uh, can be issued. Could you just quickly repeat that? The yep. permit shall not be issued until? 90 days shall have passed following the date on which the public hearing shall be conducted and closed. Jerry, did you, think, did you write that down at the same time? She's working on it. She's working on it. Where is that? Uh, nice hand right there. Yeah, it's better than mine. Well, if the town clerk could be provided with it nonetheless. Right. Yeah, well, yes. We'll yep. Not, yes. Uh, up above, you yep. also have to be reviewed and decided. Uh, shall be reviewed by the historic right. area right. board at yeah. a public so hearing. And All right. Upon. There we go. All right. Do you have to vote on the changes first before voting on that? Question. John. You know, sure. Sure. Yeah. All right. So we yes. closed it. Um, uh, well, <coughs> they're voting on amending the proposed law. Then they'll do seek, and then they'll vote on the law as amended. Uh, so this is. We actually had a lead agency vote that was going to come. Um, do we need to do that first or not? No. You can vote on the amendment. But you're not adopting the local law until. All right. Motion so. on the amendment to the proposed law. I'll second that. Um, and the amendment, as as I uh, was just it's amended, written, right. yes, stated. We all tried to write down. It's okay. just scribbled. Down. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So we made an amendment to the proposed um, amendment to the law. And um, the hearing's closed. Motion so to we had a lead agency. Lead agency. Uh, we have a motion to declare lead agency. Um, a second. And a second from a second from Jerry Batari. All in favor, say aye. 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 And okay. Then. Um, and then we have the adoption. Uh, so this is adoption of the amended law. I will make a motion to adopt. No, you have the, the adoption of the uh, of the negative deck first. I'm sorry. It's part agency. of the same resolution, but for the lead agency, the one that you just uh, uh, the lead agency vote included. A negative declaration um, that the, yeah. All right, based so on the environmental assessment form, yeah. that the action amending the town code does not have an environmental impact. All right. So, uh, motion to adopt the negative deck. Okay. In con uh, in connection with that, we uh, have uh, two comments from the Rockland County Department of Planning pursuant to GML Section 239, which the board will have to either adopt or override. The first of which states a review must be completed by the Rockland County Historic Preservation Board and any concerns addressed. Override. Um, the second is the short, uh, the seeker short environmental assessment form is incomplete and must be uh, completed. In looking at the uh, short EAF, it appears um, that the short narrative um, under question two, I think it is, uh, was not completed. That narrative uh, typically uh, just explains uh, the proposed local law. Uh, the short environmental assessment form uh, where the action being taken is the adoption of a law, uh, local it doesn't require the balance of that form to be completed, but there should be a short narrative. So. Um, my recommendation would be that uh, you know the board uh, direct that uh, narrative explaining uh, the law uh, be incorporated into the uh, short environmental assessment form before the supervisor uh, assigns the negative deck pursuant to this board's action, uh, number one. Insofar as a review by the County Historic Preservation Board and any concerns addressed, I know that Denise uh, today reached out to some county historic board. <laughs> I don't know if it was Claire's board. I don't know if it was whose board it was. Excuse me. Eileen Miller, who is the organizer of the Rockland County Historic Preservation Board, 
called me about this issue because they had had all the paperwork since July and the board hasn't discussed it. She wasn't sure it was that important. Mary Cardenas and I are both members of the board. So that's just, and Bob Knight also. So that's just extra information for you. Thank okay. you. So if the board is uh, so inclined, I would suggest that you amend the adoption resolution if it's going to be uh, adopted to specifically uh, override um, uh, condition number one from the Rockland County Department of Planning uh, uh, in that uh, the Rockland County Historic Preservation Board uh, receive notice and the opportunity to participate. Uh, and other members. To the extent uh, the county planning department uh, deems the manner of notice and the extent of notice to be defective, it's over, you override it. I'll give you that tomorrow. Um, voting on the overrides first? Um, you could vote on the override and then the. I'll make a motion to override the. Um, the Rockland County Planning Second. Department's condition number one, just as described by the town attorney, um, relating to the uh, Historic Preservation Board, which Second. I think has been well represented here and had a chance to comment, um, but yeah. failed to do so. Um, and any concerns that they probably would have lodged have already been um, reviewed, and uh, and I think that the, the board should override that comment. Second. Second from Tom Bivney. All in favor say aye. 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 Yes, have it. Um, and also just note that the, 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 the town attorney said that um, we'll wait. Um, the approval of, of the law would be um, uh, subject to my making sure that that narrative is in the EAF. It's simply um, descriptive and, uh, you know, of the content of the law. Okay. okay. So now we can make a motion on adoption, um, as I understand it? Yes. All right, I'll make a motion on adoption of this law as amended and discussed um, with the override discussed. Um, do I have a second? Jerry Pittard, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? Not hearing any. Um, the law is adopted and will take effect um, when it's been filed with the Secretary of State. John, do we need to put a roll call on the override tonight? Uh, you, you, you need a... Uh a super majority, majority so right. everyone said aye, but if you want to do a roll call to... No, I'm just... Yeah. Okay. We typically do. All right. All right, sounds good. All right, so we're on. What we want to do is we want to take a minute um, in executive session to review the, the sale contract of six acres of town land to J.P. Morgan Chase. Thank you so much, folks, for coming in. Sorry, to, we're going to hustle along to the next item. Um, and the... Um, the pilot agreement, um, because there's been some some small modifications to those documents, and we want the town board to consult with the town attorney. A motion for executive session. Do you have any second for myself? All in favor say aye. Aye. Have it. We'll be right back. So my pencil. Um, if we could have the folks from uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Brian and uh, Chris, that'd be great. Motion to motion to tell J.P. Morgan Chase to go pound salt. <laughs> All right, thank you, folks, for coming back. Um, and and um, we're here, we're, it, where we're at at the agenda is item number five um, and six, which have to do with the town sale of land to J.P. Morgan Chase to build a data center um, over at the form. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't do that motion. So a, a motion to um, re-enter re 
public session from executive session. And uh, second from Jerry Pitar, I'll favor say aye. aye. You guys have it. Um, so again, um, the item has to do with the contract of sale. Um, and the second item has to do with the tax agreement between the town, the Pearl River School District, and J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, just very briefly, it's a project. Um, 60 acres of town land are involved. Um, several dozen old hospital buildings, which are derelict, to be remediated, um, demolished, removed. Um, a data center project to be built in their place. The town board has acted on a number of, of actions to get to where we're at. Um, the zoning for the project, the approval of the basic terms of the deal, um, which were incorporated into the full contract, for, which describes the proposed sale, which we are going to vote on tonight. Um, and the, the pilot agreement is a, is a fairly standard, it's almost a little bit different, but basically it's a tax deal, um, which is typical of new construction in, in Orange Town with the school district and the town um, work together to um, provide a benefit. Now, just so folks understand that um, the, the town board's vote on these matters tonight, um, there's still some contingencies which need to be fulfilled. Um, we won't be actually signing the contract um, until some work that's ongoing with Office of Mental Health and, and J.P. Morgan Chase gets satisfaction, Office of Mental Health gets satisfaction, having to do with easements that need to be released in order for the infrastructure to be built for the project. So there's still work to do. Um, uh, I wanted to just note very quickly um, my appreciation for both the, the, the diligence and the effort um, of J.P. Morgan Chase and, and uh, who's here tonight um, but also all the people who've been involved, um, our town attorneys, um, the town board, uh, the, the, our engineering, you know, Joe Moran sitting back there, his staff, um, the highway department, just got finished building a new road to the golf course so the golfers can get back in there when First Avenue, which is part of the parcel that's being sold, um, gets sold. The, um, the parks department, how many times we've been in those buildings, um, taking people through them, and, uh, and so thank you for that, the, the um, you know, and the other agencies involved, the Office of Mental Health and Park State Development Corporation, the state providing brownfield funding, the, the all, a whole lot goes into a, a redevelopment project of a large um, derelict site. And we appreciate the extraordinary efforts that have been made. Um, the Planning Board, the Zoning Board, Architectural Review Board have all acted on the site plan and approved it. The building department and the engineering folks from J.P. Morgan have worked hard to move along the, the building um, construction and demolition permitting process and the, the drainage permitting project. So all that stuff is coming along. Um, we're all looking forward to the point where we're going to start to get complaints about how noisy the demolition is because then we'll know that, <laughs> that we're actually <laughs> um, in, a, in a stage of construction where we all want to be. Um, and that includes the neighbors as well, many of whom, um, you know, have been supporting clean and um, an appropriate development at the former hospital for many years and are excited to see a data center, which is, um, which is, is so low impact in so many ways. So, so that, that said, um, I just wanted to um, note that the, the resolution we're discussing voting on right now is the, the, it was slightly revised from what was included in the in the agenda. It's been passed out as a handout. Um, item number one is approving the execution of the contract for the sale of conveying town-owned property um, to the J.P. Morgan Chase a National Banking Association. Um, I just want to invite um, Brian and Chris if you if you want to address the town board. I just have um, one question. And we it, have some questions. And you said we, we weren't going to sign the contract. We're going to sign the contract. It's just we're waiting to close until issues I'm are I'm sorry. Resolved. That's a good clarification. Yeah, all right. We'll absolutely sign it. Um, but I know that there's some matters that need to be resolved before we can all close on the deal. Yes. Uh, yeah, we've come an extraordinarily uh, long way. As thinking back, I think the first resolution is in February. So we've been at this for six months. And... Um, it, um, it has been a true partnership. We really appreciate uh, all the effort uh, that the town has put in. We've had innumerable meetings um, with many of you, appearances before many of the boards, 
appearances before the planning board, zoning board, uh, architectural review board, um, you know, a lot of conversations with folks from the building department, the uh, Department of Environmental Management and Engineering for the town. And you know, it's a continuing process. There's, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go on this. But, um, you know, it really has been a true partnership, and um, we appreciate all the, all the effort uh, uh, and time that the town has put in on this. So uh, we appreciate it. Uh, the proposed contract of sale pretty much tracks the term sheet that was signed several months ago, you know, at the start of this process. So um, I don't think there's any controversy there. And the pilot agreement is just something that um, would normally be entered into um, even without the IDA. You know, they could have qualified for what's called the 485B uh, exemption. So um, that was uh, negotiated by um, the town and representatives of, of J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, what's, what's nice about that is, is you have a property that is currently on the tax rolls, it's being assessed, but we all know that the property is probably not worth anywhere near what that would translate as far as fair market, fair market value goes in its present state with all of the buildings that require remediation and demolition. You know, once that occurs, that will be a viable taxable lot, which it is not right now. So um, that's an important component of the deal. It's an enormous amount of money that gets invested. And, um, you know, ultimately um, it will generate taxes, which it's not doing right now. So um, those are the two matters before the, uh, the board this evening. And um, right. did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to welcome message? Uh, Chris well. McKenna, yes. um, sure. Managing Director of Global Portfolio Management for J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, I'm not sure okay. well, you've actually been in this room before. So. I, I have not, but yeah. I have uh, tracked this project for, for the many months that we've all been at it. And while it seems um, like a long time, uh, the, the town has been extremely cooperative and, and truly a partner in getting to us to this point. So a lot of work in a very short period of time, if you really think about it. So um, we're very excited to um, start the excavation and cleanup. I think trucks are lined up. So um, as, as Brian has said, there's you know, a few additional things we gotta get done, but I, I think those are more administrative at this point. And we really, really appreciate the, um, all the efforts and we look forward to, uh, to closing in the, in the next several weeks. So thank you all, we appreciate it. Great, and thank, thank you. you. Please convey our appreciation to your whole team. Thank you. Um, so, All right. so I'll make a motion that we approve uh, the contract um, that's attached and that we've discussed, and uh, and then it, it kind of goes on from there. Uh, uh, second. Take a second from Tom Divini. All in favor, say aye. Aye. You guys have it. Um, I'd like to hear a motion on the pilot agreement that's also attached and has been described. Moved. Uh, moved from Devaney, second from Troy. All in favor say aye. Aye. The ayes have it. All right. Um, so we're. Thank you, Brian. We're, we're another step along the way um, towards towards project completion. And, and, and like you, we're, we're eager to see the thing get to the finish line. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for waiting for us tonight. Um, obviously, we got to. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have to go All right, so those are the J.P. Morgan items. Does number, does, does number seven have to be voted on tonight? I don't know if there's a time because don't they start collecting school taxes soon? I think it's, I think, you know, honestly, I don't know if it absolutely has to be voted on tonight or not, um, but I would recommend that we do vote on it. It's been, it's certainly been discussed. It hasn't though. Brian Kenny hasn't been here to discuss it. Yep. There's Brian has sent out emails and has but discussed it, the issue before. Not, with, not, and not in front it, of the right, not in front of the residents. He hasn't. He, you know, every well, every well, other. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not here to make an argument. That, no, I'm that just Brian saying, is here as much as he needs to be. I agree. He should be here. Um, I'm just saying. I'm just worried that I, I, if we I'm, don't vote I'm on speaking, this, I'm just saying that every other department head, when they have an item on the agenda that will generate interest and uh, resident response, is here. And we told the public last week that he'd be here. And you know, I, if we have to vote on it tonight, we have to, but I'd like to know, do we have to vote on it tonight? 
because I, there, there's definitely residents who have questions on this, and you know, the question should be answered. Um, I'm I, honestly, I'm not aware of a hard deadline on this or not. Um, I think the days of proportion affect the uh, tax rate. Mm -hmm. the We're about to. No, I hear taxes. you. I hear you. Start doing the collection. I mean, they're about to send out the tax bills, so. All right, so we have to. If it's connected to that, Tom, then it's certainly do have, timely. Do you have his email? I have it. I can read it out if you want. Um, I, I, I read his email. I'm just saying it's. I, I wish I was a department head who didn't have to show up may, to board maybe meetings. Maybe if you read it out, right. we'll answer some of the questions. Go ahead, Dennis. Yes. I think it's a useful. Please offer. note the below email or whatever regarding the school bill. Okay. There is no appreciable difference difference in these calculations from the previous year as far as shifting towards the homestead class is concerned for school tax purposes. This is an administrative issue uh, that the town has to sign off on on the calculations each year. The state has already reviewed and approved these numbers and the school districts have been informed for the upcoming tax bills. I have already given the wording of the resolution uh, that you use each year to Vicki and the town clerk. Because the town is challenging the equalization rate on August 23rd in Albany, uh, putting off having the board resolve the town and a uh, town outside village base proportions at this time, which are used for the January 2018 bills. Perhaps we could do that in a September meeting if and when the state decides to adjust our rate. However, he's not hopeful on that. In any case, we will not be able to attend the meeting next week, so that's where we're at. All right, thanks, Dennis. I think that helps to address at least part of the concern. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the setting of the base proportions as described here? I'll make the motion. Do we have a second? You guys want to pass this? Uh, second from Dennis Troy. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? Hearing none, the motion passes. That's number seven. Um, number eight, uh, they have a few uh, budget related ones. Um, this, we need a resolution setting the public hearing for the Blah Blah Fire District's contract. Um, we will be, as it says on the first page of this agenda, they'll be making a presentation um, along with other special districts and department heads prior to this. But the public hearing uh, would be set for October 3rd at 8.05 p.m. Motion to pu set public hearing. Uh, second from Jerry Patario. All in favor say aye. The aye. Ayes have it. Um, then we got the setting of the date for um, our public hearing on the uh, preliminary budget for November 14th. Um, motion. Motion from Divini. Second over here from Paul Valentine. Yep. All in favor say aye. Aye. Right. Number 10 is the Workplace Violence Prevention Oversight Committee, which I understand is a requirement. Um, is it from the Department of Labor, John? Or is, there's a, there's well, a, a workplace violence law and the plan that I also want to thank Dennis Troy for volunteering to be on that committee with Paul Valentine as an alternate. We have Jim Dean, Donna Morris, and Joe Moran. Um, the, the new head of the director of the building department, once that person is hired, John Edwards, Eric Gordon, Chief Nulty, um, and representatives from the unions. Uh, and that committee would meet periodically um, and, and hear any workplace uh, violence related complaints. Moved. Moved from Divini. Second over here from Jerry Bertari. All in favor say aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Number 11 is um, the Orange Town Housing Authority. The membership of the, of the Courtwood Village elect representatives to the authority, um, which otherwise the other members are appointed by the town board. Um, this resolution recognizes that uh, Patricia Brown has been elected by the members of Courtwood as their representative. Uh, Dennis, you want to make a motion for this? Given yeah, the I move liaison? that Patricia Brown is a terrific uh, member of the uh, representative from the residents of the Housing Authority, and she's served a long time, and we're happy that she's continued to serve. Um, second for that, from myself, all members say aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Number 12 is a um, document received file from the town attorney's office, and it describes it here. It has to do with the tax lot. I'll make a motion for this. Here, second over here. Second. I'll second. Valentine, all in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Number 13 is the resignation of Joe Luciano as the 
Parking Enforcement. Um, really want to thank Joe for his service to the town. We know that, that um, you know, he's facing medical uh, and he's, he's recovering, um, but obviously the, uh, the town is going to need to look at um, staffing this position. Uh, we'll just thank Joe for his work during the parking enforcement in Pearl River. I'll make a motion to accept this resignation. Do I have a second from over here? Dennis Troy, all in favor, say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Number 14 is lending assistance for Pearl River Day on October 7th. Do I hear a motion for this? Move. Diviny. Troy, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Um, and then there's a couple of personnel matters that are coming out of um, the environmental management um, because of some movement of employees um, and some vacancies that were created because of that. So we'll just work our way down through them. Um, and, and any questions you have, Donna Morrison, our director of personnel is here, and Joe Moran, of course, is here as well. Um, and I'll just point out, and we, we kind of tweak the wording of these resolutions a little bit, just to remind folks that Joe Moran, as commissioner, um, has appointing authority. Uh, the town board has these resolutions to uh, kind of affirm and acknowledge um, those decisions that he's making. And of course, the town board is in charge of funding these positions, so we have a role to play in any case. Um, but the, the, so the wording reflects his leadership and authority to make appointments and the town board's um, role in recognizing it. Uh, so the first one is appointing James Lenikin, Motor Equipment Operator 2, Probationary, effective uh, August 21st, current town employee, moving from one position to another. Do you hear a motion for this one? From Valentine, second over here from Troy, all in favor say aye. aye. And thank Jim for his work. Number 16, appointing John Farley, uh, maintenance mechanic one, probationary, starting August 21st, and it describes the grade step and salary in here. I'll make that motion. From uh, Tom Diveny, second from Jerry Batari, all in favor say aye. aye. Um, number 17 is appointing Christopher Batari as laborer, probationary, in the sewer department, grade nine, step one. Um, do I hear a motion for this position? Yeah, I'll move there. Okay, Troy, and Jerry. I will be re no, I will be recusing myself on this. It's my son. Okay, Jerry's recusing himself. Um, we have a have a second over here somewhere. No, second. Uh, do you have any all in favor? Say aye. Aye. And we got a recusal from Jerry Batari. Number eighteen, <coughs> appointing Brian Antonuti laborer. Um, do I have a motion for this? No, I'll make. From Troy, second from Jerry. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Number nineteen. The appointment of Aldo Leone as a laborer. I'll move that. Move from Divini, second from myself. All in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Number 20, we have our finance director passing out the, the town uh, <coughs> vouchers. And with a with sort of a, a selection of, of some of the expenses in the, the town board's approving. Uh, the audit for tonight's meeting consists of three warrants for $2.4 million. The first warrant had 51 vouchers for $265,000 and was for utilities. The second warrant had 45 vouchers for $1 million and was also for utilities. The third warrant had 357 vouchers for $1.2 million. Uh, items of interest, number one, ADS Environmental Services, $16,000 for sewer flow analysis. Number four, Arthur Gallagher, $60,000. Uh, for third party administer, administer fees for workers' comp. Number six, Candle, 17,000 for their second half substance abuse program. Seven, Capasso, 48,000 for recycling. Number 12, Entech, 242,000 for sewer relining. Uh, that's bonded work. Uh, number 16, Global Mantello, 31,000 for fuel. Number 18, Hudson Valley Engineering, uh, 66,000 for the North Middletown Pedestrian Link. Number 20, J.P. Morgan Equipment Finance, 53,000 for the Energy Performance Contract. Number 22, Lochner Eng Engineering, 109,000 for the Route 340 Sidewalk Project. Number 24, Nary Construction, 66,000 for abatement of Blue Hill, abatement and demo of Blue Hill House. Number 28, State Comptroller, 32,000 for justice fines. And number 29, Tilcon, 41,000 for highway materials. Any questions on the audit? 
moved on the audit. Um, I'll second that. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, Jeff, for those highlights. Um, we do, uh, I want to propose, that's, all, that's it for votes for tonight. The, um, I want to propose the board that we have another executive session to talk about the, um, the staffing for the receiver, given that a whole bunch of people are going to show up soon to pay their taxes. The and the um, building oh, and also we we're just interview candidates for the building department, um, and, the, and the town board needs to discuss those candidates and their, their um, you know, which ones we think we should, which one we think we should hire. So for that matter, I'll make a motion for executive session and uh, look for a second to discuss those topics from Jerry Pitaro. I'll favor say aye. Aye. Um, and having said that, I also want to just um, do an adjournment. The, the town board will be coming out of executive session. Um, unless you guys, yeah, actually we should talk about this, um, if we anticipate being in a position to actually hire, no. to vote on appointing a building director or not. I guess my assumption was we weren't going to be taking action tonight. No. So if everybody's comfortable with that, I don't know, do we, do we talk about that? Not, Whether not voting on it. Well, Dennis wanted to take a roll vote. Um, we're not going to come out and vote on no. Yeah, no. So we're not no. planning on voting. Nobody's no. expecting that. No. Okay. No, 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 I'm talking, no, that's, no. That's, that's, that's us, yeah. Yes. Not, All right, so we're, so as usual, we're going to do an executive session, but we're not doing more town business or decision making. No. Uh, for that reason, I want to offer an adjournment proactively. So I'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting tonight in memory of two individuals. Um, one of them is Sheriff Kralik, uh, really, really well known and respected law enforcement officer who passed away. Um, and, a, and a lot has been written about him in the newspaper. I've got yours, Esther, already. Andy, you mentioned Sheriff Kralik. Is yes. he written that he also helped with the venture question and horseback riding? Yeah, he's well known for, the, for his support of the horseback in, uh, in the mountain no patrol units. Um, so, so Sheriff Kralik, um, and there's a, there's a lot that could be said about him. Um, and then um, also Nancy Scott, um, who's the mother of the assistant director of the Venture Center. Uh, we thank we Esther for, for this okay, um, who's been been uh, who passed away as well. So in her she memory, and in that of Sheriff Kralik, I'll make a motion to adjourn I this have, meeting. I have three others. Oh my goodness. Okay, go for it, Dennis. Uh, resident of uh, Pearl River, Frank Neville, N-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Uh, Danny Angley, who was the president of the Pearl River Senior A, and the How do you spell father, Angley? I'm sorry, grandfather of several uh, Pearl River residents, and Ellen Kiley. All right. Also of Pearl River. Thank you for those. Um, so in memory of these town residents, I'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Do I have a second? Over here. Jerry Pitari, all in favor say aye. aye. The ayes have it. Okay.